let's talk RME and gastritis. So we'll talk about RME and gastritis, but we'll also talk about some of the challenges in making the diagnosis. We'll talk about neuroendocrine tumors that emerge from this and the differential diagnosis, right? Let's go. I'm gonna show you two endoscopic images. The first is the gastric antrum, so forget about all that bubbly stuff. I'll tell you that the gastric antrum looks totally normal. This is the body. I can tell you that the body looks very abnormal. In fact, you can see antrum that looks relatively normal right back there. The body looks abnormal in the sense that those gastric folds have gone. It looks very flat and atrophic, and it's got this bumpy appearance. This actually had neuroendocrine tumors, multiple neuroendocrine tumors arising in the background of autoimmune gastritis. So why do I show you these two pictures? Because I want to lay the seeds in your brain, and the seed is this that autoimmune gastritis is defined by the presence of a very abnormal looking body fundic mucosa and a near normal antrum. Therefore, you need to encourage your endoscopist to get biopsies from the gastric body and gastric antrum. Bribe them, cajole them, do what you must, but you need biopsies from both these sites. Let's talk a little bit about mechanism. I typically do not talk about mechanism, but here it plays directly into what you see under the microscope. Stomach has broadly two parts. The biggest parts are body fundic mucosa and the antrum, right? The antrum is actually relatively small. All right, so bear with me. Let's start here in the body fundic mucosa. In autoimmune gastritis, you lose parietal cells. Therefore, you lose acid. The G cells in the gastric antrum sense that loss of acid and try and drive acid production. As they're attempting to drive acid production, which simply does not work because there are no parietal cells, the ECL cells, think of them as collateral damage, expand and undergo hyperplasia. ECL cells, enterochromaffin-like cells, nothing but a very fancy name for an endocrine cell that produces histamine. And of course, you realize that all of this is futile because there simply can be no acid production because the parietal cells have either diminished in number or completely disappeared. So what does that mean for you as a pathologist? One, the gastric antrum is relatively normal. In fact, it's hard to identify G-cell hyperplasia, which there is in the gastric antrum in these cases. And in the body fundic mucosa, you see loss of parietal cells they're replaced by some other stuff. We'll come to that in a minute. And there is endocrine cell hyperplasia. So normal antrum, atrophy of the body fundic mucosa, and neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia. There you have it in a nutshell, autoimmune gastritis. I'm gonna share with you three cases. They are cases of autoimmune gastritis, of course. Here's the first. There's clearly chronic gastritis. You can see chronic inflammation superficially. You can see chronic inflammation deep. If you squint hard enough, there's probably intestinal metaplasia. Clearly chronic gastritis, tons of plasma cells. There's clearly intestinal metaplasia. Those are goblet cells. These are panet cells. But here's a question for you. Is this funny looking gastric antral mucosa or is this gastric body fundic mucosa? Because remember the mantra, in autoimmune gastritis, it's the body fundic mucosa that is messed up. The antrum looks quite normal. So how do you tell between body fundic mucosa and antral mucosa? Here's the next best stain after sliced bread, and that stain is gastrin. Gastrin is positive in the antrum and essentially negative in the body fundic mucosa. This fragment is negative and therefore it is body fundic mucosa. So once we've decided it's body fundic mucosa, let's list out the features. So it's gastric body fundic mucosa with chronic gastritis, superficial and deep. Here's the important one, atrophy. What do I mean by atrophy? Atrophy is the loss of one cell type and that is typically replaced by a second cell type. The loss of the cell type here is parietal cells not a single parietal cell to be seen. And the replacement here is by pyloric type metaplasia seen here, as well as intestinal metaplasia seen here. As you can tell, the endoscopist was my friend. She got me a piece of gastric antral mucosa. I realized that it looks a little inflamed, but otherwise it looks quite okay. But am I absolutely certain that this is antrum? It looks like antrum. The pits go halfway down, and after that you have pyloric type glands, but am I absolutely sure that's a piece of antrum that's looking normal? And indeed, I am absolutely sure, and I'm absolutely sure because they are gastrin-positive cells. 
not an isolated gastrin positive cell. There's a sea of gastrin positive cells in the middle of the mucosa, and that is typical of gastric antral mucosa. So here you have a piece of relatively normal gastric antral mucosa. So case one has a relatively normal gastric antral mucosa and a body fundic mucosa with chronic gastritis, extensive atrophy, and intestinal metaplasia. There's one additional piece of the puzzle you need to make a diagnosis of autoimmune gastritis, and that is the endocrine cell hyperplasia. And I can promise you to call something endocrine cell hyperplasia, you will typically need a chromogranin stain. You will see some endocrine cell hyperplasia on an H and &E, but the chromogranin stain will typically knock your socks off, and here it is. So there's a number of flavors of hyperplasia, and this image shows a few of them. This is linear hyperplasia, that is five or more cells, endocrine cells in a row, and here they are. But there's another flavor of endocrine cell hyperplasia, and that's the micronodular hyperplasia. Notice these little micronodules, they're typically smaller than the diameter of any of these glands. And so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the final piece of the puzzle, the normal gastric antrum, chronic gastritis involving the body fundic mucosa, the atrophy, and the neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia, all of that translates to a diagnosis of autoimmune gastritis. So this is case two, and this was a 55-year-old woman. Here's a set of biopsies, but as is often the case, it's hard to sift out what is gastric body mucosa and what is antral mucosa. So the first stain you turn to is, you guessed it right, a gastrin stain. Now, much of this is negative. There's a little bit of reactivity up there. Is that gastric antrum? Now, if this is gastric antrum, you're in trouble because this is not autoimmune gastritis because that looks very inflamed. It turns out that you can have a little bit of reactivity like this in autoimmune gastritis where some of that neuroendocrine hyperplasia starts sliding up with gastrin. If this were gastric antrum, you'd see diffuse reactivity for gastrin. This is not gastric antrum. Instead, this is focal reactivity in autoimmune gastritis. All right, so unfortunately, this endoscopist was clearly not my friend, did not provide me with a biopsy from the gastric antrum, but let's see what I can do here. This is, remember, gastric body fundic mucosa. There's chronic gastritis. There's atrophy, complete loss of parietal cells. There's intestinal metaplasia. And when I look at a chromogranin stain, not only is there endocrine cell hyperplasia as seen in this fragment, but there's also a wider mass of chromogranin positive cells. This is a neuroendocrine tumor. By definition, a neuroendocrine tumor should measure at least 0 0.5 millimeters. Do I measure? Yes, I think in this case I did measure. At a very practical level, if an endoscopist sees a nodule, which this endoscopist did see, and a good proportion of that nodule is neuroendocrine, I call it neuroendocrine tumor, even if it is less than 0.5 millimeters in size. And here's a closer look at that tumor, clearly very monotonous. It was, remember, it was chromogranin positive, and they often show this gland-like phenotype, not to be mistaken for an adenocarcinoma. So this is a neuroendocrine tumor arising in the background of autoimmune pancreatitis, which places it in the category of a type 1 neuroendocrine tumor of the stomach. Remember, type 1 neuroendocrine tumors are the best behaved of all neuroendocrine tumors in the stomach. So case 3 is a bigger piece of tissue, obviously from a gastrectomy specimen. There's complete atrophy, not a single parietal cell to be seen. Take it from me, this is the gastric body fundic mucosa. There's intestinal metaplasia, there's neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia, and perhaps deep down there's a neuroendocrine tumor. This is definitely a neuroendocrine tumor, right? It's forming nests, it's extremely monotonous. But I did tell you, remember, mm -hmm. that type 1 neuroendocrine tumors of the stomach that develop in the background of autoimmune pancreatitis are very well behaved. True enough, but remember, there are always exceptions to this rule, and I wanted to finish up this little discussion with this exception to the rule. And the exception to the rule is very occasionally, these type 1 neuroendocrine tumors that develop in the background of autoimmune pancreatitis 
can spread through the entire wall of the stomach and in fact there's metastasis to that lymph node. There it is going through the entire wall of the stomach. There's perineural invasion and there is metastasis to the lymph node. How do you like that? And the one thing I've learned is there are rules. Not every tumor lives by those rules and this is an extremely unusual example of a neuroendocrine tumor arising in the background of autoimmune gastritis behaving in an aggressive fashion. But what is interesting about this case is even after they metastasize, they may, make, they may even make their way to the liver. In spite of all of that, this class of type 1 neuroendocrine tumors continue to behave very well. So you can resect them and these patients will survive for extended periods of time. And for those of of you who are fond of key 67 the key 67 la labeling index was less than one percent there was virtually no mitotic activity this was indeed a grade one tumor so just a few words a uh, very brief words on the differential diagnosis of autoimmune gastritis and i'm going to use this 67 year old man to illustrate this point as is often the case your endoscopist will throw multiple fragments all into one cassette and it's for you to sift out which of this is body and which of this is antrum. I can tell you, because I've seen this on high power, that this is antrum and this fragment is body. So here's the antrum. How do I know this is antrum? Because of my gastrin stain. Notice these gastrin positive cells. There's clearly chronic gastritis and this isn't mild or slight, this is significant chronic gastritis. Now, whether there's atrophy or not, it's somewhat harder to tell in the gastric antrum. I can tell you that there was no intestinal metaplasia here though. Here's the body mucosa. And again, there's significant gastritis. It goes superficial. It also goes deep. I can tell you that this was negative for H. pylori gastritis. How do I know this is from the gastric body? The gastrin stain was entirely negative. So the question is, is this autoimmune gastritis? And it is not. One is because you have a very diseased antrum. Perhaps there's some atrophy in addition to chronic gastritis. There's a body that is clearly shows chronic gastritis, but it does not show neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia. And therefore, this is not autoimmune gastritis, but instead, this is what is referred to as multifocal atrophic gastritis, a disease that is primarily involves the antrum, but in many cases extends to involve the body fundic mucosa. You often see intestinal metaplasia. This case did not show intestinal metaplasia. This is a disease driven by Helicobacter pylori gastritis in most cases. Where's the Helicobacter pylori? Well, that went away a long time ago, leaving behind this mess. But it is also driven by environmental factors such as stuff in your diet, etc. And hence, it's best to be vegetarian. So here's a quick summary comparing autoimmune gastritis with multifocal atrophic gastritis. I'm just gonna hit on the highlights. Autoimmune gastritis is mostly a disease of women. You characteristically see neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia in the body and fundic mucosa, while multifocal atrophic gastritis is predominantly a disease of the antrum. You do not see neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia in the body fundic mucosa.